test, 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 test. Test, 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 check, 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 no? Test, one, two, check, 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 I don't know. Test, one, two, check, test, one, two, check, 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 check. All right, if you guys will stand and worship with us.
The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days. Oh, yes, I will. singing before you are seated turn around shake someone's hand let them know you are glad that they are here All right, you can have a seat. We're so glad you're here today. For those who are watching online or maybe you're engaging with us for the very first time, welcome to Rejoice Church. And all of you in here, of those who might be visiting for the first time or maybe you come back, it's been a while, we're glad you're here. My name's Aaron Pontius. I serve as the pastor here at Rejoice Church, and so it's a privilege to gather together and to worship. A couple of things. First and foremost, if you are visiting, uh, you probably received one of these. I'd encourage you, if you don't mind, if you would fill that information out, give us as much information as you're comfortable with, um, and then afterwards you can either leave it on your chair or give it to myself. We'd love to, to get some information just so we can encourage you and, uh, and, and reach out to you and connect in, in any possible way. If, you are, if this is your home church and you've been here for a while, 
Take advantage of the Connect card as well. Any prayer requests you might have, any needs that you might, uh, or might be dealing with that we could possibly help and serve you, we want to do that. So please take advantage of that. And one more thing. If, uh, if you're not receiving a weekly communication from our church, it could be that for some reason we don't have the proper contact information. So it would also be helpful that if you would like to be a part of that, whether you're new or not new, um, take advantage of that as well. And just give us the right email address and the proper contact info so we'll make sure that you're getting the things that you need. Um, this morning, every week we have an opportunity to, to worship on Sunday, but we also have an opportunity to give back to the Lord just a portion of what he's blessed us with through worship as well. That's our giving. And so we encourage you, no obligation whatsoever, we really mean that, but if you feel led to give back to the ministries of this church, we encourage you to do so. You can do it online through our website or at the back when we dismiss um, on those boxes. But also I want to make you aware that as a denomination, we're part of the Free Will Baptist denomination, and this month is what is called our Mission Month, and on I said October. On August 28th, we were having what is known as the World Mission Offering. And so what that is, in case you don't know, it's a partnership with our sending agency who sends missionaries all around the world in all kinds of different ways, different situations, different circumstances, different countries, different contexts. But it's the sending agency that we have a lot of our, our people in our denomination that are spreading the gospel around the world, including the Duncans that you guys are very familiar with who are in Ecuador. They're partnered with I am it's International Missions. And so on that date, we're going to be a part of that and just be, be able to give. If you want to and participate, we encourage you to do so. You can go to their website, iminc.org forward slash WMO. If you want more information to participate in a small way or a great way, we just encourage you to consider that. Um, that's coming up very, very soon. And then as we continue to worship this morning, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews all summer long, and we're going to continue that today. Um, and I have been finding myself so encouraged, and I've been learning a lot. I hope that you have too through this series. Um, I'm learning, I hope, just as much and, and maybe even more than you are. I get to really dive in deep. It's been so fun for me. And there's times, based on what I'm reading in Hebrews, that I just want to praise the Lord in those moments because I'm realizing, I'm reminded of just what he's blessed us with through his sacrifice on the cross and through the blood of Jesus. It makes me think of just straight praising the Lord. And I think of Psalm, like Psalm 148, where the psalmist writes this. He says, praise the Lord. You're going to see this over and over again. Praise the Lord from the heaven. Praise him in the, in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on the earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart, praise the Lord. It's just, we have something to be praising God for. Maybe you came in today, you can't, it's been a rough week maybe. It's been a rough time, a rough season. But I promise you, if we focus on his faithfulness, which we're going to talk about in depth today in Hebrews, you're going to be reminded that there's always something to praise God for. So I encourage you today as we continue to worship Let's keep praising him and keep that on our forefronts of our, of our minds. So I invite you to stand. We're going to continue to worship this morning. My 
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy last week. Let's hear you sing it loud. Yes, in your freedom, here 
Father, thank you so much for the give forgiveness that you offer to us. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for your blood and your sacrifice and your love for us. Father, thank you for meeting us here. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place. We invite you here. Pray that you would speak to us through your word. We love you, Father. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you for that worship. You can be seated. <clears throat> At this time, any of our kiddos that want to participate in our kids' worship, you can head that way to the kids' worship area. And parents, if you haven't checked your kids in, make sure you do so, please. Awesome. Well, like I mentioned a second ago, we have been walking through the book of Hebrews all summer long. And some of you might be ready to get done with it. I'm enjoying this, but we are almost finished. We have a few more weeks left. Um, but we've been walking through this series, and this is a series that we've entitled, Jesus is Better. And uh, so if you're visiting with us online for the first time or in person for the first time, let me, re- let, me let you know why we've entitled it that. You see, the, the author of this book, he's writing to a group of Christian, of Jewish Christians. So these are people who have grown up Jewish, they are Jewish, but they profess their faith in Jesus. But the challenge now has become, they have all this pressure around them in the culture to revert back to the old law. Because they don't like it. The peers, that the people they grew up with that have not professed Jesus, they don't like it. And so they're putting the pressure on. They're being persecuted. So the writer of Hebrews is warning them. He's saying, listen, don't revert back to the old way because the old way is now obsolete. Jesus is simply better. Like He, he tells them he's better than the old prophets. He's better than the old law, the old sacrificial system. And he's showing them how Jesus is superior. And so we came to the point last week in the conversation where the author he begins to talk in depth about blood and about the atonement of sin and how it, it, God's requirement is the shedding of innocent blood. And so we learned last week that in the ancient world, and it still applies even to, to sin today, is that in the ancient world, in ancient Israel, under the Old Covenant, an innocent life was shed to cover or atone for the guilty life. So an animal sacrifice was offered through certain sacrificial animals. Their blood was spilt, their blood was shed to atone for the broken and sinful lives of the people. But what we also learned is that because they were animals, they can't represent human sin, so they were insufficient. They were temporary. Every year, the high priest would have to go back and do it again. But then Jesus ushered in a better sacrifice because he not only shed blood, but it was his own blood. It was his blood. And so because he also represented humanity as a human himself, God came in human flesh, then he once and for all died for all of us when we learn that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So he's coming off the heels of that. And we're going to pick up right where we left off, starting in verse 19 of chapter 10. So we're going to read through the first half of what we're going to cover today. 
entirely, and then we'll break that down, and when we get to the second half, we'll, we'll go through that verse by verse as well. So let's begin Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, and then we'll dissect it. It says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. I just pray that your spirit will guide us this morning, that we'll learn, that we'll apply these truths to our life. We thank you for what we're going to, to consume today. And it's all for your glory. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So I first want to just commend those who've been able to stick through us this, stick this out all summer long, because we've been walking through some deep stuff. And the first ten and a half chapters of this book have been difficult to digest, I should say. And, and I would say we've covered some complicated theological details that isn't necessarily easy to process or to follow. But I thank you for leaning in and learning with me as we've gone through this. And today's text, the author turns, and he, he's going to begin to talk more about things that are practical and things that are more applicable instead of all those complicated things. So these are somewhat easier to process. So he has built his argument up to this point to where it's going to be more practical and more applicable to his audience, but also to us. So the section that we just read begins with that word, therefore. And we've learned that anytime you read the word therefore in the Bible, you have to ask, what is therefore, therefore, right? And so when you see that in God's word, it's in reference to everything that was said up to that point, okay? But in this particular case, this particular therefore is in reference to all that he has said. So far, all ten and a half chapters up to this point. So this, therefore, is not alluding back to something he said two sentences ago. It's everything that he has said so far, all right? So in verse 19, that, therefore, is because of all that we've said, now he starts talking. So I'm going to recap really quickly what he's covered. It'll be quick. The first, ten, the first four chapters, the author talked about the superiority of Jesus Christ He's superior to the Old Testament prophets, to the angels, to Moses, to Joshua, even Abraham. Then through chapter 7, he covered how Jesus' priesthood was superior to the old covenant priesthood. He is our forever high priest. The old priesthood, they had to be replaced every time because they were humans, like they would die, and they had to be replaced. And so he was a better priest, bringing in a forever priesthood. In chapters 8 through 10, the author revealed how Jesus ministers on our behalf in a superior temple or superior sanctuary, and with a superior offering, because his blood offering is not the blood offering of an animal that's insufficient. His blood offering is his own blood that's not only sufficient, it satisfies the justice of God forever and ever. So once and for all, uh, sacrifice. And so all of that leads us to this therefore. So with that, that in mind, verse 19 again says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So all of this stuff we have confidence. We can enter before the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. So just as the Jewish high priest only could approach God with a blood offering, right? And one day a year, remember we covered this a lot, one day a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they could go in there to atone for the people. But we, he's saying, we have confidence approaching God. Not because of, our, not because of what we've done, but because of the blood of of Jesus. So we can approach God not based on our own goodness or our own righteousness, but instead we approach God based on the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us. That's what he's reminding his audience. This is foundational by which I can approach God. The author is saying that we can have confidence that we can go before God boldly, again, not on anything on our account, but only because of the blood of Christ. So the Apostle Paul, he talks about this as well, and he's talking about how we can approach God, not because of our account, not because of our own flesh, but only because of Jesus. Look at Philippians 3. It says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. 
So Paul is saying we glory in Christ, we don't glory in ourselves. So there's nothing that we can do to approach God to make him think, okay, yeah, you're good, you're worth, no. He is perfectly holy, and so only through a perfect sacrifice can we ever approach him, and that was the person of Jesus. And so I am completely unworthy. I have no standing in and of myself that I can approach a holy God as I am. I have none, right? I don't deserve it, but yet I can come boldly before God only because of what Jesus has done. And so we can have confidence, approach him confidently, not because of us, purely because of the blood of Christ. But how do we stay focused on that confidence? Well, I'm going to borrow something that the writer says later on in chapter 12. This will be familiar to a lot of you. Look at Hebrews 12, 2, where he says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or the author and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So our confidence comes through the blood of Jesus, but we can consistently stay confident by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, who's the author of our faith. He's the author because it's only through him salvation can be had. It can be experienced. So because the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, he is, he is the author of the faith that we can stand on. He's also the perfecter of it. So even after salvation, he's constantly working in our life, shaping us and molding us to be more like Jesus through the presence of the Spirit. So he's perfecting us too. Right? Not perfect. We won't be perfect. But he's perfecting us in that he's making us more and more conform to the image of his son. So in the next few verses in chapter 10, he not only says we can approach God, but he tells us how we are so to, to approach God. So look at 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, it says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So this new way, this living way, and it says he's opened by that curtain. Do you remember a few chapters earlier, he's talking about how in the Old Testament or in the Old Covenant tabernacle, there was this curtain, this veil that separated the holy place, which was the front, the front room of the tabernacle, and the holy of holies, the holiest place, which is the back room. It was in the holy of holies that only the high priest could enter in one day a year. That was it, only, because that was where the presence of God would meet them. Only one day of year. And so by him saying he opened that way, remember when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that that same curtain, that veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that God has opened a way to approach him, but only through his son Jesus. And when he said it is finished, that veil was torn, we can now, so that curtain is open, but then the author applies this extra detail. He says, but it was through his flesh. In other words, He's tying how that curtain was open. Our access to God is now available through Jesus who offered his body. His flesh was torn. His body was beaten. His blood was shed through that. But notice how he describes that word way. It's a new way. It's a living way. I, lo I love this so much. Okay, so the new way, it's new only in that in relation to the old covenant. It's a new covenant. The old covenant is now obsolete. Because Jesus died once for all, and his blood sacrifice is the perfect substitute for us, right? But I love that he adds this word living. That word jumps out to me. It's a living way. It's important because living is a word that I think describes the new covenant really, really well. It's often associated in relationship to talking about the new covenant all throughout the New Testament. There's, and I'll give you several examples, but here, there, there's all throughout the New Testament, but a few about this living way. Look at First Peter. The Apostle Peter writes this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Okay? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a living hope. It's a living gospel. It's not a dead gospel. It's not wishful thinking. It's living. It's alive. Later on in that same letter, Peter writes this. In chapter 2, verse 4, As you come to him, talking about Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So he's talking about Jesus. How, again, a living hope, but he's also a living stone. Remember, Jesus was referred to as the stone that the builders rejected, but it became the cornerstone. It was the foundation of all that we stand on today. And so he's saying, as you come to Christ, he's the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God. But notice the next verse, how he describes us. Verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house 
So I love this language because he's using the same language that the Apostle Paul uses, but a different metaphor, a different analogy. See, Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ. We are all one body, but made up of different parts, right? Just like your body has different parts of the body, but it's all one body. We are one body, but have different gifts and different experiences, and we contribute in different ways, but it's all for the whole. Peter's using the same language, but a different analogy. He's using living stones coming together that we construct a spiritual house. So collectively, we are the body, we are the spiritual house of worship, but it's all through the living stone. We ourselves become living stones. But look what Peter says in the second half of that verse, verse 5. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Why is he talking about sacrifices in this way? The old covenant's obsolete now. The new covenant has come. Jesus died once for all. What's he talking about, about these, living, these sacrifices, these spiritual sacrifices? Well, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's not dead. It's alive. We are a living sacrifice. In the old covenant, something had to die. Blood had to be shed. And in the death of something innocent or a creature that was innocent, it covered the sin of those that were guilty. But it was temporary. Jesus died once for all, shed his blood. So all, have, all can have forgiveness who put their faith in Jesus. But he didn't stay dead. He conquered death. He is alive today. And through his resurrection, we also can live. And so we are a living sacrifice. Some people can hear that and think that's a negative thing, that it's going to be, it con it's controlling, it kind of confines us, and we can't do what we want to do. And, and in one sense, I can understand where that perspective is, but here's what the reality is. It's actually the most freeing and the most fulfilling life that anyone can actually live is to offer ourselves to the Lord as a sacrifice. This is what I mean. See, I believe with all my heart, and there's incredible evidence to support this just from a human experience, and you just pay attention to the world, and then you align it with Scripture, what we know about the evidence of God. I believe with all my heart, you and I were created to know our Creator and to enjoy fellowship and friendship with Him forever. That's why you have breath in your lungs. That's why we were made. But sin, we chose our own way, and in choosing our own way, it has broke that relationship because now He's still holy, and now we cannot be in the presence of holiness, not perfection. And because of that, we are now unable to walk in the purpose that he made us for. But then came Jesus. And Jesus lived the life we couldn't live to pay the price we couldn't pay. And in doing so, by placing our faith in him, that purpose of our life is restored and we can walk in that purpose. So that when you and I, if you choose to follow Christ and then give your life to him, what you'll find is actually more fulfilling than living for yourself. Because in living for yourself, what you end up doing, whether you realize it or not, is you worship the self. But you and I know if we're being honest and looking in the mirror, we are not worthy of that kind of worship. We know that. We like that. There's something that feeds our pride, but at our heart of hearts, we know we're not worthy of it. And so when we dedicate our lives and we give ourselves as a living sacrifice to honor him, he's given us salvation. We can respond and give him ourselves. It's a wonderful life. It's, it's, it is a fulfilling life. We're not perfect by any means. We're going to make mistakes. But to honor the Lord is actually gives us the greatest purpose because it's what we were made for. So it's a living sacrifice. Look what the, the writer said earlier in Hebrews 4, talking about God's word. He says, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So you see this concept of living. It just permeates the new covenant. It, 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 it kind of encapsulates it all. It's all alive. It's all living. So we can see the idea of a living hope. This living gospel, right? With living stones, with living sacrifices, engaging in a living word, it all connects to this passage in Hebrews where it talks about this new way, this living way. And when you look at the, the definition of living, it seems obvious. And by the way, it is. It's nothing fancy here. Even in the Greek, it means exactly what you think it means. It means not dead. <laughs> living means you, are, you exist. You are still active, right? Like you are having life. And so that is exactly what Christ has done in us. It's exactly what he has done through us. If you surrender your life to Jesus and you profess your faith in Jesus, he brings this living way, right? In the way that we walk, the way that we talk, and the way that we make decisions, and the way that we serve people, it is alive and it's life 
giving. It makes me think of just the human experience of death. So we are, we are affected by death every single day. It impacts us every day. We're confronted with it. And we can observe the world and the culture around us. We see it as well. We see it personally. We see it around us. Something is always dying. And it's not just people. We know people pass away. But something is always dying. It's something that's always decaying or it's rotting figuratively and literally. Relationships fall apart. Some last forever, and those are beautiful and wonderful friendships, but we all probably have experiences where relationships died. Sometimes it's our own fault. Sometimes it's, it's a fault that's not ours, but they die, right? Reputations die. They erode, especially in the culture we live in right now, this cancel culture idea. I mean, you see reputations falling apart left and right, and it's on the public sphere. Reputations are dying. You see, the economy may, may or may not be dying. The car, a car might die. Your job might die. It might decay. Fill in the blank. My point is, death and decay is a part now of the human experience. There's no avoiding it. But if you profess your faith in Jesus and the saving work of the cross, he says that we've been birthed into this living hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's based on a living Savior. It's a living gospel, living hope through a living way. And so anytime we open our Bible, we can engage and embrace in the living word of God. So what kind of witness are we to offer? What kind of testimony do we have the privilege of testifying? You see, we look around with all the impact of death on you and on me and throughout the world. We have the opportunity through Jesus to say, I choose life. I choose life that is offered in Jesus. It's a living way. It's life-giving. Maybe you know of someone, maybe you don't. I hope that you do, and I hope that some of us are in this room. But maybe you know of somebody that you, they really believe in, in the gospel of Jesus, like with all of their heart. And there's something about them that is so intoxicating in a good way. And it could be that even right now in your life or at that point in your life, you didn't believe and believe what they believed, but there was something about their, their demeanor, their words, the way they talked to you, the way they looked at you, the way they cared for you. It was like, man, I, you want that joy. Like, it's life-giving. You didn't feel like it was zapping you of your energy, but it was like, man, that person strengthens me. And I'm just going to testify and tell you it's because of Jesus. Like, Jesus brings life he offers life, he is life, and he is alive. So we have a living hope, living sacrifices, living stones, a living word, all because of a living Savior. Look at the next few verses. Verse 21 and 22 says, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So here he reiterates the issues of, of assurance, of confidence and boldness. But you notice he, he uses some terms about cleansing. And so basically he's just, again, he's reminding them, remember, he's at a point in this conversation where all ten and a half chapters before was an argument reminding them of being, warning them to be careful to turn away from Jesus now. And now he's going into a more practical approach. So he's reminding them of all that. Therefore, remember, we are clean, we have been sprinkled clean, our bodies are washed clean. It's the emphasis that he is giving here is because of what Jesus has done through the cleansing of his blood. And due to that cleansing reality that we have in Jesus, we can have assurance in this, that he has cleansed us, he has made us clean, and we've been washed, and my assurance rests on that truth. But then he continues this train of thought in verse 23, and I love this verse, because this applies so deeply to us today as well. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. To hold fast the confession of our hope. Now, what is the confession of our hope? Well, simply, that is the declaration of faith that you make when you accept Jesus as Savior. That means you profess your faith in Jesus and the work on the cross to save you and forgive you. And maybe you haven't done that. That's the most important decision that you and I can ever make. But that's what he's talking about here. And so he's saying to them, hold fast to that confession of hope without wavering. Now remember, the people to whom the author's writing to, they were tempted to let go of that confession of hope. They were tempted to walk away from that confession of hope. But the author's saying, don't let go, hold fast. 
He's going to say a lot more about this in the next chapter. One of the most, maybe the most famous chapters in the New Testament is called the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. But he's talking about holding fast to this confession because these people were wavering. They were scared. They were anxious. They felt like, like their foundation was unsettled now. And maybe you're there now. Maybe you've been there where you feel like the things are just, are just crazy in your life or and maybe your, your faith is being tested or your life's just being challenged in so many ways. What well, they were being challenged in profound and very impactful ways in every facet of their life. Because you think all of their upbringing, all their relationships, their business connections, their status was all being questioned or taken from them simply by placing their faith in Jesus. All that they grew up in the, in the Jewish heritage culture was taken from them. Because they no longer walked in the old way, they were walking in this new way, this living way. And the people around them that, didn't, that rejected it were not standing for it. And so the pressure was intense. So the author is reminding them to not waver. But why? He tells them at the very end of that sentence, he says, because for he who has promised is faithful. He's faithful. So if there is ever any wavering going on, he's what he's telling them. He's saying, focus on the faithfulness of God. And by the way, that's true for us today, too. We can think of all kinds of circumstances that might cause our life to feel like it's unwavering. It's just, it's, it's off kilter, whatever it might be. And let me just say, no matter your circumstances, no matter your problems, no matter your challenges, or whatever it might be, if you and I can learn to focus on his faithfulness instead of our problems, on his faithfulness instead of our circumstances, what you'll find, what I'll find is that we can have a stronger foundation because we're not focused on us, we're focused on him. Remember what he says in Hebrews 12, fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. So when we take our eyes off Jesus, what happens is we get our, our eyes onto ourselves, whether we realize it or not. And in doing so, what we focus on is our problem, our desire, our whims, our wishes, our ambition, whatever it might be. And in doing so, it's going to cause us to be easily wavered or manipulated or persuaded. And he's saying, look to the faithfulness of of Jesus. Look to the faithfulness of God. So let, our, let us be fixed on his faithfulness because he never wavers in his faithfulness. The next two verses, 24 to 25, says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the word day here is in reference to the return of Christ. Okay? So as they were anticipating the return of Jesus, he is pleading with them. He cares for them. He's telling them, listen, hold fast to that confession of hope because the one who promised, he's faithful. And the very next thing is piggybacking off of that sentence is saying, don't stop meeting together. That's what he's telling them. It's clear here that what he's suggesting is they needed each other. And so do we. Whether you're willing to admit it or not, we need each other. We need each other. We need each other. We need to gather together to stir one another up, not in a negative way, but to stir one another up in love and in the good works of Christ. We need to encourage one another to pursue Jesus and to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. You see, we all need to gather together. When we gather together, is it's a holy thing, and it's a necessary thing. We are all desperate for encouragement from one another. Some of us, maybe we struggle with pride, or we don't want to be helped, we don't like being helped, we want to be the one helping, maybe because that makes us feel better, or maybe it's because we genuinely want to. I think sometimes we battle both of those, right, if we're just being honest. But sometimes we just don't like being a burden. We feel like a burden, we want to burden other people, so we don't share what's really the need in our life. And the reality is we are all desperate in, desperately in need of encouragement, both giving it but also receiving it. So some of us are good givers, and not good receivers. Some of us are good receivers and not good givers. He is suggesting, he is encouraging. God's word says we need to be both. We have to be both. That's coming off the heels of saying, hold fast to that confession of hope without wavering. Why? When we gather together, this is what it should look like. We gather together united in Jesus because that's why we come together. It's to worship Jesus, our Savior. But in doing so, we encourage saying, hey, how can I pray for you? What's going on this week? Hey, hold fast to that confession of hope. Don't waver this week. How can I encourage you? When you go to work, don't waver. Like, hold fast to that confession. So it's gathering to encourage the pursuit of Jesus so that during that pursuit through the week, 
we can effectively be the hands and feet in the testimony of Jesus. Do you see? He, says, he basically says, don't stop meeting together. We need that. It's a holy thing. But in doing so, it's not about being consumers. Or we just come together and we receive a blessing from worship. That's a good thing. But we also want to be contributors to the greater body, to the spiritual house that we're coming together to contribute so that we're encouraging other brothers and sisters to continue to be strong and resolute and to not waver. All right. So he's encouraging them. He's showing them to have, we can have confidence in Jesus, hold fast to that faith, hold fast to that hope. But this next section, he goes back to his warning mode. Out of deep love for his audience, he's going to give a pretty stern warning. And the reason I am giving a disclaimer is oftentimes this specific passage is taken completely out of this chapter and read in isolation. And when you read passages like we're about to read in verse 26 and 27 in isolation, it's often given a superficial interpretation and falsely applied. And so I want to be careful. We're going to read it, but understand it has to fit in the context of the whole theme of the book because that's what the writer is writing about. So verse 26 and 27, again, it's a warning of caution out of concern for these people. He says this, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So these verses and the, the two that follow, we'll look at in a second, they, have to be, they can only be properly understood within the context and the theme of the entire book, okay? Because he's talking about when we sin deliberately or we sin willfully. The Bible refers to this, another word they, they often use, the Bible uses is the word transgression. So to transgress means to violate a known boundary, okay? So that means, like, I could admit, hey, I did something wrong and I knew I did it wrong. Like, I, I, I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. That's how we should say it. Or I knew it was against God's word, but I chose to do it anyway. That is a transgression. Or parents and grandparents, it's like when you tell your kid, don't touch that. And they look at you and they touch it anyway, right? They're transgressing against you. <laughs> I have four transgressors in my house right now. No, but seriously, like, that's the transgression. That's what it means. And so it's to know there's a boundary, but deliberately choosing to cross that boundary, okay? That's a transgression. So when you read this, he's saying sinning deliberately or those who are committing transgressions willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth. That means after they've come to profess their faith in Jesus. So what this sounds like taken, out of, taken in isolation is if you willfully sin, that means if you choose to lie or if you choose to say something hurtful, you know it's going to be hurtful, even if it's someone you love or it's a complete stranger, then if you take it in that superficial interpretation, it's going to sound like, well, then there's no sacrifice for your sin anymore. In fact, all you get now is judgment. And honestly, if that's true, that can be overwhelming and a little bit horrifying. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I make mistakes every day. Like, I'm not perfect at all. Um, I, I, I battle pride every day. I think, you know, you think of it, you name it, that's, I, I struggle with it. And so when I look at this, I think, oh man, like that's, then what is, all I have is judgment. This is a problem. But when you look at the, the Bible, you'll think of, you can probably think of characters right now, even if you're not super familiar with the Bible. Major characters all throughout Scripture who committed transgressions, meaning they knew there was a boundary, they willfully chose to cross that boundary and broke God's law, broke God's command, broke God's word. But yet, after a season of repentance, you see them walking in God's goodness and God's grace. So it's proof that God forgives transgression. So then what could this author be referring to? What does he mean by deliberate sin, willful transgressions? Well, look at verse 29. He actually talks about what he is referring to. Again, look at the context of the, of the letter. Verse 29 says this, how much, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has, and he lists three things. One, has trampled underfoot the Son of God. Two, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. And three, has outraged the spirit of grace. So, and talking about this deliberate sin, this willful transgression, is a person who, who will trample underfoot the Son of God, who will profane the blood of the covenant, 
and who will disgrace or outrage the spirit of grace. So that's what this person does. But how does that person do this? How do, how do we do this? Is it by falling into sin? Is it by making a mistake? Is it by getting angry and saying something you can't take back? Is it by going through a season of rebellion and being far from God? Is that the case? How, does this, how do these three things happen in a person's life? Well, I would first say that is not the case whatsoever. Because if that was the case, it would contradict everything that this author has been saying up to this point about the finished work of Jesus. You see, when he died on the cross, he said it is finished, meaning the work of salvation has been done. You place your faith in Jesus, profess your faith in the saving work of the cross. It says that he has covered your sin and he has forgotten it. In fact, it says, I'll cast it as far as east is from west. So that's done. We make mistakes. Now, that doesn't mean that we just do whatever we want and like, hey, it's No, because we want to have intimacy with our Lord, fellowship with our Lord, that's why he made us. Then when we do make mistakes and we have sin in our life, man, the, the wisest thing is to repent and confess that to the Lord so that that intimacy is restored. You don't have to feel convicted to constantly pray for salvation again. That work's done. See, that's what Satan does, though. The enemy's real. He will tempt us to believe, hey, you're not really saved, are you? You don't, look what you did. And he makes us question, like, it's that assurance thing all over again. No, no, that work's done. So then what is he talking about? Well, John, the Apostle John, writes this in his letter, in 1 John, basically testifying in, in, in what I'm talking about as well. He says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I love that, that title, Jesus Christ the righteous. And look at verse 2, the first part. He says, He is the propitiation for our sins. There's that kind of long biblical word, propitiation. You may not remember what it means. That's okay. Propitiation means, it's a word that means to take away wrath. To take away wrath. So Jesus Christ is the one who's removed the wrath of God on our behalf by taking it upon himself. So God's wrath is aimed at mankind. And let me just pause here and say, and I think that's fair. Now let me say why. Again, take a step back a little bit. Try to be objective here and not be emotional. Let's be objective. If God really exists, and it's the kind of God that the Bible describes, and I believe it is. There's evidence for it, but I believe it is. If God exists, that means he's perfectly good. And perfect goodness means every good quality or characteristic we can think of, he possesses it to the perfect degree. Everything. So love, he's perfect in it. Grace, he's perfect in it. Kindness, he's perfect in it. Justice, he's perfect in it. So if God is perfectly good, that means any breach of that goodness, whether great or small, great or small, he will serve his justice perfectly. And so if I'm honest, the wrath of God, which is his judgment, is aimed at mankind. And I think it's right. If he really is perfect and he's good, because his justice will be served perfectly. But here's the beauty. Jesus is the propitiation for our sin, which means because of Jesus, God's grace is, God's perfect grace is also on display by providing his son Jesus to stand in the pathway of that wrath and absorb it himself. That's what Christ has done. So God is perfect. So his justice will be served perfectly and his wrath must be satisfied. But he's also perfect in his grace and his kindness. So he provides a way through his son Jesus to absorb that wrath so that his justice will be served And so his grace will also prevail. You see? It's awesome. It's incredible when you think about what Christ has done. So then again, going back to those three things, how does someone trample underfoot the Son of God? How does someone profane the blood of the covenant? How can someone someone, uh, outrage the spirit of grace? Well, remember the theme of Hebrews. The writer is addressing this letter to the people who had embraced the gospel of Jesus. They embraced it. They believed it. But now they were turning away from the gospel. They were choosing to turn away from the gospel. They were going back to depend on the law as if the law was sufficient to atone for their sins instead of the sacrifice of Jesus that they already know tr- truly does atone for their sins. So that's how this thing is done. This is how someone can, can do these three things that's listed here. By once experiencing and embracing the forgiveness that is offered through the sacrifice of Jesus 
and then knowingly and deliberately rejecting that forgiveness that's offered through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what he is describing. It's like saying, I don't believe or I don't care that Jesus died for me or anybody else. I don't care anymore. That sacrifice of Jesus, I reject that on the cross. I think there's a different way to have eternal life or if there is eternal life, right? That means someone who in- embraced it, who had a, a saving faith, but yet chose to deliberately walk away and abandon it, to forfeit that. That's what he's referring to here. So it's, not, it's more than just simply falling into sin. That's covered. That's covered by Jesus. But the author is talking about a determined decision on the part of the one who embraced the gospel but now is rejecting the gospel. Let me also clarify this. This is not saying going from faith to doubt. This is going from faith to complete unbelief. Those are two different things. Because I know I've had seasons of doubt where I'm not so sure if this is true. There's too many other voices out there that are lobbying for my attention, and some of them are really, really engaging, and they sound really powerful. And so I might be thrust into a season of doubt. Like That happens. But the question is, what are you going to do with that doubt? You see, sometimes, I think one of the things that frustrates me most, not just as a pastor, but just as an observer of our, of our culture right now, is we have all kinds of questions and doubts. That's just kind of what we do as humans. But right now, instead of really seeking truth, what we're finding to be the normal thing now is that people just seek answers that make them happy, that make them feel what they want to feel. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, let's be honest, there are some days what I want to do is not probably the right thing to do, right? And so sometimes what I want to be true isn't true. I really wish I had a million bucks in my bank account right now. That would be awesome. It ain't true. And so what we're finding is when we have doubt, when we have questions about the biggest things of life, man, what an awesome opportunity to seek truth no matter where it leads. And I believe if you seek truth with all your heart, it'll point you back to created everything. Because if he really is who he says he is, well, then he is truth. But we just get lazy with that. And so this is not suggesting going from faith to seasons of doubt because God can handle our doubt. It's going from a a place of true faith to a rejection entirely. That's what he's talking. He's warning them because they're being pressured to do this. He's warning them. Look at verse, 10, verse 30 and 31. It says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So why is he saying these things to believers? Again, it's because he's reminding them of the fact that if you reject the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross... There's no other option except to stand before a holy God in judgment. Because again, if God exists, if he really exists, and and if he made us to be in friendship and fellowship with him and enjoy him, but yet we broke that friendship through our rebellion to do our own thing, and we all want to worship ourselves instead of the God who's worthy of it, well, then it means by God's standard of what perfection and perfect justice is, that means there will be judgment. And so if we reject the cross, what he's saying is the only other option is judgment. Like that's what's on the table. So if we reject Jesus, all that's left is to properly be, be judged for rebellion against a holy God. So he's telling his people, listen, God wasn't blowing smoke when he said he's going to judge the world. He is going to judge the world. And God will judge sin. And he is just. He must judge sin. His character demands it. But here's the beauty of the gospel. Again, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He absorbed God's wrath so that we don't have to take on God's wrath. That means the gospel says that those who are in Christ, those who profess their faith in Jesus, that judgment's already been passed. That judgment's already over. Jesus has been judged for us on the cross. Amen? Like, that's what he has absorbed for us. So those who are in Jesus, like, Jesus took that judgment. He took that wrath upon himself so that we can have, be forgiven for a holy God. That is incredible. And again, he's reminding them of what they have in Jesus. And in his closing comments of this chapter, and we'll close up right here as well, the author now, he's, so he, he's excited to say, hey, all this stuff is true. Because of that, we have confidence in the blood of Jesus. We can approach God because of that confidence, hold fast to that profession of hope. And because the one who promised is faithful, don't, for, don't, don't forsake assembling together. You need each other. I'm going to warn you, be careful of this temptation to revert back to Judaism. It's dangerous. Like there's no other sacrifice for your sin. If you do that, only judgment. 
And then he's going to affirm them here in these last few comments of chapter 10 because he's going to validate their hardships. Sometimes, isn't it just awesome? Awesome maybe too strong of a word. Refreshing. When someone just validates that they, they see that you're going through some hard stuff. Isn't it? Because sometimes we just like, I just wish someone would just know that I'm struggling. And when you have somebody you look up to and you love that's invested in you or sees you, like what you're going, and they say, hey, I see what you're going through. Sometimes that alone is just what we need to keep fighting, right? And so right here, he's going to affirm them and validate what they've been going through. But then he, he ends it with the encouragement, like, but don't stop standing for what you need to stand for, okay? Look at verse 32 and following. He says, but recall the former days when, after you were enlightened or, or you professed your faith in Jesus, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. So he's acknowledging they suffered because of their faith. Verse 33 sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So again, he's acknowledging, hey, you, since you profess faith, I know you've struggled. You've suffered. Some of you even suffered publicly, public humiliation, public embarrassment, public excommunication, public stripping of whatever status you had in your town or your city. He's acknowledging this. Look at verse 34. For you had compassion on those in prison. So he's, he's complimenting them. The next comment. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. What's he saying? He's validating that what they've gone through. He acknowledges, I know it's hard for you. I know it is. You suffered for your faith. You've been publicly humiliated for your faith. You've even served each other in prison and joyfully gave up all your possessions. Why? Because he says, since you knew that you have a better possession. What's he talking about? Their salvation in Jesus. He's like, because you knew you had something they couldn't take away from you. And that was your faith in Christ, your salvation you have in the blood of Jesus. They can't take that from you, and you knew it. In fact, it's not just a better possession. It's an abiding one. Well, who abides with us? The Holy Spirit. So it's a possession that no one can take from you, and someone is always with you. That's the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. So therefore, verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which was a, has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And these last two, uh, next verses, he quotes Habakkuk. He says, for yet a little while, and the coming one will come, referring to the coming of the Messiah, and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And so now he, sin he finishes all of those things with this final comment of encouragement. He says, but we are not those who shrink back. We are not those who are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is a powerful like, time of encouragement that he's giving these people. So in short, the righteous, what he's saying here in these last few verses is the righteous must live by faith. You have to live by faith. It was true then, 2,000 years ago, to his original audience. But guess what? It's true today too. You have to live by faith. We have to live by faith. We all can have confidence in the blood of Jesus. We can have faith in God. And we have faith in his faithfulness. So we should not shrink back but trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Listen, we don't go to heaven because we are good. Like, this is a pervasive lie that's creeped into our culture and our churches. Like, we don't go to have, we don't have eternal life through our goodness. No matter what we are able to do, what we're able to accomplish, because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. See, God is perfect. And even our best is pales in comparison to his perfection. So, that is fundamentally false, that we can be in his presence through our goodness and our good deeds. But this is what the Bible does say. The Bible says that we can go to heaven because we are forgiven. Amen? Because we are forgiven. And we are forgiven because Jesus bore our penalty on the cross. Like, upon our profession of faith and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, we can have confidence because Jesus provides a better confidence. We can. We don't have confidence in our goodness, in our abilities or whatever, but we have confidence in what Jesus has done through the cross. 
So our confidence is not in our goodness. It's not in our skill sets. It's not in our bank accounts. It's not in our political leanings. Our confidence is in Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So let's hold fast that confession of hope because the one who promised, he is faithful. He's faithful. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this reminder. God, I am so encouraged by this reality this morning. Um, Lord, this, your, your, your word is just full of insight, full of wisdom. But as Hebrews 4.12 says, your word is also alive. It's not this just ancient book into an ancient world. It is alive, and it cuts to the very heart of who we are even today. No other book does this the way that your word does this. And I pray that as we reflect on the goodness of God, as we reflect on your faithfulness, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Help us to not fix our eyes on ourselves or our problems or our circumstances, though that's often tempting to do every single day. But Lord, when we're tempted to do that, help us to instead think about your faithfulness in those times. So Father, even as we walk through the hardest moments of life, but your word says that you are with us, that you guide us, that you comfort us, that you shepherd us, it's because you're faithful. So we thank you for that reality. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room or watching online who've never professed their faith in Jesus, that maybe they've heard about it, they've been around it, but never personally acknowledged that they fall short of your glory and they need Jesus to cover those things, to be the propitiation of their sins. God, we thank you for that truth. Help us to apply it to our lives. We thank you so much for your words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to close in one more song um, of worship. But if you have any questions about faith, questions about what we just studied, or maybe questions about what it means to take, make a decision to follow Jesus, man, we would love to encourage you and, and disciple you through that. And so if that's you, you can come find me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you or just talk to you, whatever you might have. Um, in the meantime, let's, let's continue your worship as we close out this morning. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots. And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, he washed it white as snow, he washed it 
white as snow. Amen. Well, I'm so thankful that you're here. We got to worship together. And uh, as we dismiss, a few things. Again, if you feel led to continue to worship through giving, we encourage you to do so. Uh, again, no obligation, but if you feel led to do that, you can give either online on our website or at those boxes at the back. Um, we're so thankful that you're here today. And if you have connection cards you want to turn into me, please do so. If not, just leave them on your chair. I'll grab them later. But again, if you have questions about your faith, about what it means to follow Jesus, you need prayer, I'd be happy to, to serve you in that way as well. All right, let me pray, and then you guys can be dismissed. Father, again, we thank you. You're good to us. Bless us this week. Help us to encourage one another, to give encouragement and receive encouragement. Help us to hold fast to the hope, the confession of that hope, and to remember that you, as the promise, the one who makes those promises, you are faithful. Help us to rely on that this week. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. You can be dismissed.